So now I've got it reversed. I've got the one gallon plastic jug that I had my sanitizing solution in down on the bottom. The one gallon jug on the top with the, stick with the sanitizing liquid inside. I'm actually going to transfer from the gallon jug back to this plastic jug. Same way, give it a suck, throw it down on the bottom, try and get all the sanitizing solution out you can, and then I'm going to invert it onto the blue plastic piece to start to drip dry. Uh, I pour it back into this jug here. I keep it, uh, I keep it for this brew. I might use it on the next one. Um, I kind of recycle it. I feel that it's sanitized. It kind of sanitizes inside the bottle. I don't use it for more than two brews, um, and then I will make a new solution. And so far I have not had any problems, so it seems to be working out. I'm going to make sure I get all the liquid out of here. Again, you don't want to shake it, you don't want to jostle it too much, the glass one, where, the, where you're going to put your juice, because it'll just make bubbles, it'll make foam, and you can't get it out. You have to rinse it out, and then you got to start all over from scratch and sanitize your bottle. So we're just about done here. You can't see, I know, but I have the glass bottle kind of tipped on its side to get all the stuff out that I can. Hopefully I've... Yep, so that's all done. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this siphon hose and set the other end back in here. Um, I don't think I will need it, but I'm not sure. Um, you know what I need? Yeah, one more thing. So, another thing is I need a funnel. Uh, probably should have talked about that at the beginning with all the parts here. I do have a funnel, a plastic one. Uh, what I'll end up doing is sanitizing that funnel, placing it on the gallon jug here, and then pouring the cider that I make into that, um, rather than try and siphon it through the hose. I find that pouring it through that funnel kind of gives it more aeration, helps get more air incorporated into that bottle, uh, it gets everything mixed up and ready to go on its fermentation. So everything needs to sit for a little bit longer. I'm actually going to go get that funnel, spray some sanitizing solution on it. Alright, so now what I've done is I looked on the back of the yeast, and usually on the back, um, where is it, here we go has the preparation instructions to get it rehydrated. What you have to do is add a specific amount of water, um, ideally get it around 100 to 105 degrees, and then you want to let it kind of sit in a container. I have this little Corningware dish that I sanitized, and I let it sit in there to start doing its dividing, bubbling, coming back to life, getting back from this dry state in the pack back to something that's actually living that will start your fermentation for you. So I have 50 mils of water. Um, you will not probably be able to see that, but there it is, 50 mils. I have this thermometer, um, yeah, old school style, that I'm going to heat the water up to about 100 degrees, pour that water into the... make sure this fire's off here. Alright, technical difficulty there. So I have the fire going here, we're going to put the thermometer in here and get that up to about 100 degrees. It won't take very long. And actually, most of the time you're measuring the heat of the pan. So I kind of... I don't know. I sort of do it by guesswork. Like, it's already starting to kind of boil here on the bottom. So I know that it's pretty hot already, so I'm going to shut it off. And I need to... Let's see, with my third hand... I'm going to do this. I need to kind of get the hot tip so that I can get the measurement of the water and not on the pan like so and now of course you can't see the gauge but it's rising pretty quick it's at about 95 coming up on 100 kind of slowing down You just want to make sure that you don't get it too hot, or you'll kill the yeast. Um, basically, you'll just kind of boil it, kill them, and then it won't be any good. So now what I'm going to do is... 
is pour the water into this sanitized corningware dish. Maybe give it another check just to make sure it's not too hot. Because this would be all a waste of time if you dump the yeast into boiling hot water. So I think by the time we get it in there it should be fine. It's about 90. It's going to climb up to about 100 degrees. So what you want to do is you want to take your yeast, kind of, oh you know how you do this kind of with it, get it all down on the bottom, open it, and then pour it on top of the water. But you don't want to stir it. And so what you do is you just take it like this, and I kind of just sprinkle it on the top of the water, kind of real delicately, and kind of spread it out over the water. What happens when you stir it, I found, is whatever you put in there to stir it with, the yeast kind of clings to it, and then you end up a little bit short because you can't get the stuff off whatever object you stick in there. And also, you kind of just want to let them sit there, do their own thing, and kind of start to come back to life. So you can see it's all full here. The water's kind of turning, it's getting... Let me get my fat head out of the light. The water's kind of absorbing into the yeast. The yeast is kind of already coming back to life. So we're going to let that sit while we do the rest of our cider. And then by the time we're ready for that, it'll be back to life. So now I'm going to do, like I said, a specific gravity reading and find out where we are with the scale and the specific gravity before I add sugar. I'm not going to do that. So what I can do, it's kind of time consuming. I don't have a big, big syringe. Someday I'm going to get one. As I take this 10 mil syringe that I have, let me see if I can see that. Yeah. And then just pull from, actually no, before I do that, let me give it a stir here and make sure that it's all incorporated the juice and the water so that I get an accurate reading instead of just picking up just water or just juice. So yeah, it's all stirred, it's all incorporated. And then I'm just going to take, unfortunately, oops, malfunction here. And my syringe just broke. Okay. Unfortunately, 10 mils at a time. You get it up to that line that, can you see that line on there? That's the line that the hydrometer reads at zero. So that's like the, the minimum amount of liquid I can put in here to get that reading. So I don't necessarily have to fill it to the top to get a reading. But I, okay, so I have it filled to the line. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the hydrometer, make sure it's in the shot before I do this. Yep. I'm going to take the hydrometer, hold it steady with one hand, put the hydrometer in the juice, start to let it go, but then as I let it go, I'm going to spin it. And so what that does is it dislodges all the bubbles that are going to stick to the side of a hydrometer. So that, that way you can get an accurate reading instead of it being full of bubbles. So as it starts to stop spinning here, I'm looking down and I see, oh, let's see here. You've got to kind of turn it, get it where you want it, so that you can see. Um, right now it's about 10... 1046 is what it is. So, let's see here. I always keep the pencil nearby. And I'm kind of a dork. I don't use paper. I write it on the counter because I don't want to have paper flying around or getting wet or dirty or whatever. So I'm just going to write 1046. 
on the counter. The way you write it is 1.046 is specific gravity. I'm going to glance over here at my thermometer for my ambient temperature and write that down. So right now it's 72 degrees. And that'll come into play later on when down the road when I want to find out what my alcohol content is. The recipe I have calls for brown sugar. I don't have brown sugar, so I'm going to use cane sugar. And we'll see how that comes out. The only cider I've made once was with brown sugar, so we'll see. So I'm going to start with about three cups. One. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? Two cups. I'm going to start with two. Give it a stir and do a reading. Because I'm not familiar with making cider with cane sugar. I don't want to get my specific gravity too high. Because like I talked about, I just don't think it's necessary to have it, you know, 15%. To me, that wouldn't be enjoyable. I do want some alcohol in it, but I don't want it you know, to bust my sock, knock my socks off. So I'm kind of going to give it a stir here, make sure everything's incorporated. Just like that. And then kind of do like I did before. I'm going to pull off some juice into my hydrometer. Do another reading and see where we're at with two cups of sugar. There we go. So again, with the sanitation in mind, because I've now got this in my hand and I've been touching it, I'm kind of going to get that. I'm going to give it another spray just to kind of keep it sanitized. Put it in here again. You see that? Give it another little spin. So see now, with two cups of sugar, it's running a lot higher than it was. So now I'm at. It comes around here. I'm at uh, my old eyes here. I'm at about 10. Wow. So two cups brought it up to about 1084. So yeah, cane sugar apparently is a lot more dense than brown sugar. So this is actually going to be a little bit stronger than I anticipated, but that's okay. So I'm going to write that down, 1.084, 1.084, pour this back in here, and actually for now I don't need this anymore, so I don't have to be too concerned with it being sanitary. Uh, let me get my sugar out of the way. So now what we're going to do, let me show you what the yeast is up to over here. See those little piles that kind of have formed? Um, you see that? So it's fairly well reconstituted. So what I'm going to do now, is now that it's a little bit back to life, I'm going to take a toothpick and kind of just carefully poke this little island right here to get all these yeast cells that are on the top, make sure that they're submerged in water as well. See how it broke up and now there's just a bunch of dry yeast in there. So I want to make sure that all this yeast gets full of water, contact with the water, give the sides here a little stir, and now kind of everybody's in the pool here so that the rest of those can get started here. A little bit sticks to the toothpick, but it's just such a small amount that it doesn't really matter. In my opinion, if you use other something else that it sticks to it, 
you know, a little bit more. If you use it right away and stir right off the bat, it sticks to it. Um, and so there you go. So here's my calculations. 1084, 72 degrees. This was pre-sugar. 1046. So now I'm just going to kind of put in my little notebook that I have. 1084 at 72 degrees. And the next thing we're going to do, I'm going to put this back up on its legs, is we want to add pectin enzyme. What that is, is it's kind of a derivative of apples. The pectin is what, mm, two things, it kind of clears up the cider um, or the mead if you use it in there. I use it in wine as well. Helps it, you know, get rid of the cloudiness that happens when you process juice. Uh, what happens if you heat juice, it gets cloudy. Um, so the pectin enzyme helps with that cloudiness. So I didn't heat this, but I still use it because I like a clear product. Um, pectin also is what's used when you can jelly. Uh, it actually helps form the jelly and gets it kind of clumpy and stuck together so that it's not just liquid, that it actually kind of congeals. So two different uses. I have powdered pectin when I do canning and I have this liquid pectin here. So the recipe calls for um, it's well the usage is a quarter teaspoon for for five gallons. Uh, my recipe is an eighth of a teaspoon um, and that's actually for three gallons. So let's see here. Um, quarter what did I say? An eighth of a teaspoon. Let me see. Here. Do I have anything else? Yeah. So probably like, oh, I don't know. I would actually probably just count it in drops. Well, maybe not. Let's try this. Let's see what an eighth of a teaspoon is. So it's about, I don't know, 13 drops or so, 14 drops for that gallon. Um, and it tends to stay clear. I think, I mean, I've used pectin all the time, the, the, the couple of times I've brewed and it's clear. Does it stay clear from the pectin or does it actually just occur clear? I don't really know. Um, the yeast energizer, the last batch I made, let's see here. Um, go from 10 grams. Actually, I used a different product. Um, so the directions on the back say a half a teaspoon per gallon. So that's what I'm going to use. Get my hand dandy measuring cups. Half a teaspoon. Um, I guess people can put it in the yeast. I tend to just kind of put it into the mix right here. I kind of do like a rounded half a teaspoon. I figure the more nutrients that yeast has to get a good start, the better. I don't think that you can, I think you can maybe give it too much nutrient, but I think a nice rounded half teaspoon should be okay. Um, so now the only thing left to do is do what they call pitch the yeast. So what you do is you just take the, uh, the container that I have here with the yeast, give you another look at it. it seems to be fairly well incorporated. Um, everything, actually I can see it bubbling already, so it's doing very well. It's ready to roll, I think. So let me see if I can get this back so you can see. Uh, the angles are kind of funny. Sorry about that. Actually, you know what I can do?